Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. Thursday, right? It is Thursday. I tell you what, the days, who knows anymore? It is June 18th. I do know that. So glad you could join me today. It will be fairly short. Uh, I got a couple of very interesting things to share with you. Part of the overall educational experience that I like to provide to you. So welcome. All right, let's get rid of me for a moment. Take a look at the Eastern Pacific. This is the only area where we might see development anytime soon. And by soon, I mean at least five days away. National Hurricane Center out of Miami indicating that a 20% chance of formation because environmental conditions could support some slow development in this region early next week. This entire area going to become more active with convection energy coming in in the form of a convectively coupled Kelvin wave from the west will seed this area with more moisture, more vorticity, less shear, and all of that will combine to probably give us one or two tropical cyclones somewhere in this vicinity uh, over the next 10 days or so. I do not see in the pattern, I'll just tell you this right now, it's a little bit of a bold statement, but so far I don't see anything in the pattern that would suggest a threat to any of these areas when in fact something does develop in this area because the steering currents are such that whatever does develop should stay out to sea like that, maybe sending some waves up towards Cabo San Lucas and vicinity. But the port areas around here, I guess not that that matters much in terms of cruising, thanks to COVID-19, grr, um, you don't really have to worry about hurricanes. At least there's that, all right? We got enough to handle as it is. So real quick, let's look at the outlook for this area via the GFS. There's the coast of California. There's the Baja Peninsula. I'll outline it for you. The Gulf of California and the coast of Mexico down towards Guatemala, El Salvador, and through Central America, um, the Pacific side anyway. And here's the Gulf over here. Just so you know your geography of where are we looking. And then I want you to keep your eye on this region right through here as I put this into motion, one frame at a time, 24 hours out, 48, 72, not much going on. But there is an increase at this point now uh, in some energy down here by about 72 hours out, but nothing substantial just yet. All right, so we keep going to 96 hours, a little bit more in the way of energy, and you can start to see that low-level westerly wind coming in there. That's that convectively coupled Kelvin wave uh, sneaking in. This is the 5,000-foot level of the atmosphere, so that's relatively low in the atmosphere, isn't it? I think it is. It's not quite the surface, but Anyhow, once we get out to about day five or so, a little bit more in the way of focused energy, but it's not until a week out that things really start to get going off the coast of Mexico and Central America, maybe twin tropical cyclones developing. And I mean, this is 10 days out now, so yeah, you know, we usually don't look that far out with any degree of accuracy, but it is showing this model here, the model is showing a symptom of what's to come. That's the way I look at it. All right, so there you go. Again, no major threats that I see uh, to, to this part of the, of the Pacific coast of Mexico and elsewhere. But we'll stay on top of it because you never know for sure, do you? All right, in the Atlantic Basin, boy, everybody talking about the Saharan air layer. It is the topic... Uh, of the week. And again, considering everything else that's going on, so be it. Might as well talk about the dust out of the Atlantic uh, rather than other. I mean, some obvious, some, some topics obviously need to be addressed. I understand that. But there's so much negativity. So when we can throw some interesting science in uh, to make things a little bit more tolerable, why not? And the Saharan air layer definitely gaining uh, attention this week. There it is, very prevalent coming off of Africa, the African Easterly Jet, 700 millibar level of the atmosphere, uh, pushing this warm, dusty, 
air layer, Saharan air layer, or the SAL as we call it, out into the Atlantic. This will spread uh, all the way across through the Caribbean and end up into Texas and even up into Oklahoma. How do I know that? Well, I trust the computer models, the guidance here. Ryan Maui tweeting this recently. Look at that, the Saharan air layer. This is the NASA GEOS-5 dust extinction, aerosol optical depth, <laughs> whatever. It's the computer modeling showing the suspended particles in the atmosphere and where they are projected to go. Really neat, if you ask me. Look how these things turn clockwise as they go across, the clockwise rotation. That's fascinating. And um, that dust will make it across through the Caribbean. Uh, in fact, we will definitely be monitoring our two nest cams that we have in the Virgin Islands, one on St. John. It faces sort of southwest, and the other over in St. Thomas. I believe it faces north or something like that. I'll have to ask Timothy about that. Um, Brent and Tim host those two nest cams at their residences. For me, for our interest, we'll tune into those. This is several, several days away. Uh, looks like about June 20th or so. So about three days away, two or three days away that that will impact the Virgin Islands. Yep, about the 20th or thereabouts. So uh, this will end up in Texas and maybe even Oklahoma and parts of the southeast. And uh, get ready. Uh, you know, in the Windward Islands, the Leewards, and beyond, uh, you're going to have some incredible sunsets. And so what is this all about? Well, the very talented folks over at the weather.us, weathermodels.com, weather.us, did a blog. And this is fascinating stuff here, so I'm just going to kind of take a peek at this. I encourage you to follow these folks and read about it. You have Jack. Dr. Ryan Mallory, Mallory, Dr. Ryan Maui, and uh, I guess that's that's Jorg, something like that. Uh, guest Arthur, Arth I can't talk today. Guest author John. Anyway, um, let's see who wrote this. If it's mentioned at the bottom, usually the author. Yep, this is from Jack. I figured it would be. Uh, Jack does some amazing blogs. Uh, for these folks. So Tropical Cyclones 101, what is the Saharan air layer? What impact does it have on activity? This is some interesting stuff in here about the sounding. And if you know how to read a sounding, he's annotated it here. That you have rising air cooler than its surroundings. The Saharan air layer is in here, etc. Um, definitely check this out. Uh, and these soundings are done all around the world, by the way. So very um, important upper air, it's called an upper air sounding. You know, you get a profile of the atmosphere. Um, but I like this. So how do we track the SAL? Without a network of upper air stations scattered throughout the Atlantic, we can't easily pinpoint regions of warm, dry air at the mid-levels. The water vapor satellite imagery helps, but it's too focused higher in the atmosphere. Thankfully, the origin of this air mass over a desert means that we have a helpful indicator to see where the SAL is and where it's headed. And that indicator is, drum roll please, dust. Yep, the same winds that blow this hot air from the Sahara Desert out into the Atlantic also pick up plenty of dust and sand, that particulate matter that I talk about from the desert. That dust is, and sand is lofted into the atmosphere where it can remain for over a week as the dry air moves west. And that's what Dr. Maui is tweeting about here. This is the product from the NASA tracking and whatever, and it tracks that dust. It's just absolutely incredible, I think. Um, and the cloud of dust is picked up on different methods here. But look, there's your dust through here, this pinkish color, and then the crimson color in here, I guess that's crimson or blood color, that is convection or moisture fairly far to the south associated with a tropical wave that is moving off. And if we go back to this satellite animation, there it is right there. That's the moisture coming off. And as these come off at higher and higher latitudes over the coming weeks, the SAL outbreaks will be much more to the north up here. 
And then these tropical waves will get ejected into the Atlantic and they will begin to develop. It's just a matter of time. And it's, you know, you got to have the sal outbreaks first. And it's a cycle. It's like the old circle of life thing. These come out, these big sal outbreaks, they are an indicator. I'm telling you folks, this is getting a lot of attention, and rightfully so, in squashing development because the dry air, the stable air, does not allow for any convection. But noticing what we have to the south here with this moisture area, all you got to do is let off the gas just a little bit. And the Saharan air layer, when it comes off more to the north, and you'll start to see that over time, then these tropical waves come out and they'll take advantage of a warmer than average main development region, water temperature wise, and we'll have a very busy hurricane season. So while these sal events are interesting and do put on a uh, the kibosh, as it, as it were, to, for development right now, I'm telling you, that impressive of a sal outbreak is a symptom of a very vigorous African easterly jet. And the AEJ, as it's called, those African tropical waves, they get their origins. That's another fascinating topic. We're going to have to get somebody to talk about that on Hurricane U uh, one day soon. You know, How do the tropical waves even form? Where do they come from? Anyhow, it's all related, and it's all indicating more evidence towards a very busy peak time to the hurricane season uh, in later August through September and into October. You know, we'll probably have some development between now and August. Yes, I think we will. But the main thrust of activity later in August, these strong sal events, I believe, are a harbinger of things to come. All right, trying to get out of here. That stupid, it's the G key. When I hit the G hotkey on the keyboard, it makes me go away. This program that I use is called Ink to Go, and it's my annotation software right here. The little buttons highlighting, and I have hotkeys. G makes me come on, and Z makes me highlight stuff, whatever. Sometimes I get confused. Easy to do when you're excited to talk about the things that I talk about. All right, I'm done. Have a great rest of your Thursday. <laughs> it is definitely Thursday. And um, I'll be back with more for you tomorrow. We'll figure out something interesting to chat about, I'm sure. Uh, remember, I'm on Twitter, at Hurricane Track. Follow me on YouTube and become a subscriber. And hit the notification bell. And you get notified if you want to when I update something. And we are supported by our fine patrons on Patreon. That link in today's description if you want to become a patron. All kinds of good things for you. Uh, if you become a long-term sustaining patron, even a short-term, doesn't matter. Your support is appreciated, and it helps all of this happen. Have a great one. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. Again, thanks for tuning in. I'll be back with you with more tomorrow.